So welcome to Pride and Prejudice. This is uh, our quarterly uh, inclusion initiative um, uh, program. Uh, it's my last one, um, Steve Sturman. Many of you know Steve. Steve will be taking over the FJMC inclusion chair seat. Uh, he's in Europe right now, but he'll be taking it over after convention. Um, so you'll be, uh, you know, referring any questions or needs or comments about inclusion to uh, to Steve. Um, so um, we. The, the FJMC, in coordination with Women's League, I'll just give you the, the, the 30 second uh, how we got here routine. Um, FJMC, along with Women's League, um, at the kind of, uh, I think at the, at the request of Alan Budman, this was Alan's project, and um, uh, decided that we ought to have some dialogue about and, and develop an initiative about inclusion. That we all talk about more members and younger members and all this, and we think we're very welcoming. And as it turns out, we are very welcoming. We're, you know, the, the, the guys and the Women's League uh, women are nice people and uh, try to do good things. Um, but it turns out that we have a bias uh, that we kind of don't know a lot about, but we, we tend to think we're all alike and we're not, right? we kind of know we're all different in different ways. We know our families are different in different ways. We know that 15% um, uh, of us or some approximate percentage like that are Jews of color. We know that among us are not all straight uh, uh, guys. We know that um, uh, some of us are single and sometimes feel a little left out. Uh, some of us have uh, different uh, ethnicities uh, nationalities going on in our family, and sometimes we're a little feeling a little bit awkward about participating at synagogue and in men's club. So this initiative developed with who are the marginalized communities that we want to make sure that we kind of focus on for a few minutes and welcome into the into the fold uh, of of men's club and women's league. So both of our organizations, both of our uh, organizations, have on their website now. Uh, inclusion initiative information and resources. And I just want to take a couple minutes to show you what's available. I'll just go to the FJMC, FJMC website to show you what's there. Um, I assume you're seeing that. Okay. And so this is the homepage, the cover page for FJMC, and it's live. I think you're seeing it live. So in a second, it might pop up here on the uh, little screen that changes every once in a while, but we won't wait for that. We'll go right up here to programs and go down to inclusion initiative. And here's our front page, so to speak, for the inclusion initiative. Now, I wanna focus here on this box up here to the upper left because it has a click here where you can get our entire inclusion resource guide, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, you can get a list of outreach organizations and programs. So if you're trying to focus on a particular marginalized community, there are all kinds of organizations that help support these folks, um, 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 you know, assimilating into the regular groups of people. Uh, even, you know, they're regular as well, but you know, it, you know, for those of us that are, that think about others, uh, there's a sample press release if your club or your synagogue wants to make a splash about being welcoming to everyone. Uh, there's a self-assessment that seems pretty popular, and we'll, we'll go to that in a second. But that takes the 27, I think it is, um, uh, parts of our program, the 27 recommendations that, that the group came up with, and gives you a chance to say, are we okay on this one? You know, does our rabbi talk about inclusion? Um, does our website... Uh, uh, say enough about everyone's welcome here. Um, so it identifies the, the recommendations, the suggestions that we that our group came up with and put into, into our report and gives it to you in a way that you can kind of walk through one at a time and talk to your club or talk to your board at the synagogue or talk to the clergy or whoever you're going to talk with and say, here are 27 things. Now we're not going to do all 27 things and we're good at some of these and probably not good at others, but here are 27 suggestions that Women's League and, and FJMC folks came up with, uh, developed, that are really good, good suggestions. So we'll, we'll walk through that a minute. 
There's a speaker's bureau request form if you need somebody. Typically at our synagogues and our clubs, we have people that understand inclusion and we can pretty much take it from there, okay? And I wanna get right to the resource guidebook. So you're, we're not gonna bother going through 30 some pages of resource guidebook at all tonight, but I wanna share with you that the resource guidebook, like here's, here's the number, uh, here, here's the number three. Okay, number three suggestion at the top, place welcoming language on the synagogue website, preferably on the homepage. Okay, simple suggestion that we came up with, with examples here that you might want to do. So if I click under here, because it says, look at your synagogue's web, website from the point of view of someone who's non-binary, LGBTQIA+, a single parent, a Jew of color, Jewish by choice, an intermarried couple, or someone with physical or mental health issues. Does the language and presentation on your website speak to them? Okay, simple example of one of our 27 things. If I click on the little blue here, here's an example. It goes right, to, it happens to be my synagogue, B'nai Yashirin yeah. here in Cleveland, but it goes right to a web page that immediately all are welcome here. Okay, and it talks about interfaith and hearing loop, uh, uh, you know, he hearing loop things and then goes down to quotes from people about how welcoming, here's inclusion Shabbat for special, I'd say special kids, but these are special adults as well, neuro challenge types. And we have a special once a month inclusion Shabbat. Here's torch awards. We won, we, we, were, we were given three torch award mentions, uh, one for a virtual bus trip. So anybody could join a virtual bus trip, right? Online, um, our comedy benefit event that we had. And we have these, these happy hours, well, they aren't weekly anymore post-pandemic, but uh, we had that at the time where, again, anybody, no matter what issues you have, what individualities you have, could be online and, and run with this stuff. Here's about the inclusion Shabbat. So all I'm mentioning to you is that in the resource guidebook, there are clicks digitally to get you to examples of things, so you don't have to recreate from, from nothing something, okay? So that's what is... Uh, that's the kind of stuff that's sitting on our website. Um, I do want to go to the self-assessment here for a second. So let me just click up there. I mentioned it to you. So the self, let's go to number three. Okay, we just did about welcoming language. Place welcoming language on the synagogue website, preferably on the homepage. That was number three on our, in our booklet, you know, in our 30 some pages. Now we just say to ourselves, are we okay with this one or not okay? Well, at B'nai Yashur and when I, where I am, we're okay now. We weren't when this first came out. This was motivation for our uh, uh, inclusion chair at B'nai Yashurin in Cleveland here to take a look at this and say, boy, we, we should get something up on the website. And this number three was the motivation for uh, Dr. Jerry Ehrenberg, our guy, to kind of look at this and say, I was thinking about that. That's a good idea. We should do that. So you say, are we okay or not okay in this, in this one? Or maybe we should and you have your little group of guys or your synagogue board, whoever is working on this, maybe we should uh, you know, put this one together. It doesn't take that long. So all the 27, I, here, look at number five, just as another example. Meet with clergy and lay leadership at the synagogue and club level to discuss inclusion. Are we okay or not okay with this? You might say, well, we, we, don't, do, we don't do any of this. Now, if you're at Rabbi Adrian Rubin's congregation, uh, she'll be on in a little bit to speak. Um, to us in Springfield, New Jersey, you'd say we're okay with this. Our rabbi and our later, lay leadership, our clergy and lay leadership really understand inclusion and get engaged in that. So we really don't have to do anything on this one. You walk through and see which ones you need to do more with. It's pretty unusual to have a clergy or lay leaders say we shouldn't be welcoming to everyone, right? I mean, most of us say, yeah, we, <laughs> you know, we, we need to take a look at this and make sure that Although we think we're welcoming, let's make sure that people feel welcome. So, um, you know, it's some dialogue and most clergy and lay leaders are into, we need to do this a little better, we're, we're in, right? It's not that hard to do, but you do have to have someone initiate the conversation in some synagogues or clubs, okay? Because of this report, um, my own club um, sat down and said, boy, we have events, the same people come to them all the time. Well, why is that? Because we kind of have fit the event. These people like that event. But I don't know that we think much about the friend of ours who uh, really can't get around too well or the friend of ours that had a stroke 
And maybe we should be saying somebody will pick you up, bring you over, we'll help you through this and get you home. And we don't, we, we didn't do much of that until we got thinking about it with, with this report and this information. So that's really, um, you know, what's on the website and available to you. Okay, do we have any quick questions about that? We have a question here. Let's see. Any thoughts about flags on the Bema, recognizing, welcoming different folks? Well, Rabbi Adrian Rubin, who's going to come out. Oh, here she. I see her. I see Rabbi. Hi, Rabbi. We'll, we'll get to you now. But she's going to explain to you uh, some symbolism that, that they have on their Bema uh, to recognize, uh, you know, again, the welcoming attitude that we all want to have. So, yes, the answer is you can do that. But again, you know, you do have to go through your own clergy. Um, we're going to talk about this at convention. For those of you folks that are going to be at the at the convention this summer, and one of our breakout sessions is going to be how to support supportive clergy, right? Um, and another one will be a breakout session will be um, if you have clergy reluctant to get involved in this. You know, you do have synagogues where you have. Um, let's see, what's the probably the the biggest hurdle that people have have expressed to me is quietly, kind of quietly, because they don't really want to say this too loud, is that we have older conservative members, big donor types, and we don't want to tick them off. So how do we say we want to be welcome to uh, LGBTQT and not get these people riled up about, well, we welcome everybody, we're friendly to, and you know, we don't want to, we're afraid to shake the card up a little bit because these folks are uh, minion people, they're big donors, you know, you get this kind of thing. And so at convention, we are going to have a breakout session about how to work through some of those hurdles. Okay, so FJMC and Women's League, uh, both are doing this initiative together, but also you'll see programs from USCJ, you'll see programs um, from all kinds of organizations now about inclusion. When we started our project, um, Jerry, what was it, Good two years ago now, I bet, when we started our project a couple of years ago, um, uh, we, we knew we weren't on the cutting edge of inclusion, but we didn't think we were too far behind. And it turns out we're right about the right time that, that we're, we're hitting, we're hitting the, the time where people are thinking smartly about making sure that everyone's welcome. So with, with all that in mind, I'm going to be quiet for a little bit and we're going to invite, you might want to put your view on speaker view if you haven't already. I mean, it doesn't matter to me, but if you put it on speaker view, then whoever's talking is going to kind of be larger on your screen. And we're going to, I think, start with Jerry. We have Jerry Jacobs, who is the, who is, is right here ready for us. We have Eric Perlman, who is uh, on a train um, uh, somewhere in Virginia, uh, on a train jo joining us there. And we have Rabbi, thank you, Rabbi, for getting here. I know you had a uh, um, uh, um, a commitment here prior. I'm happy you're, you're on with us. And Rabbi Rubin is uh, Springfield, New Jersey. David Glass's synagogue, for those of you that know David. Okay, so we'll start with Jerry. Jerry, do you want to talk to us about your experiences or what you're thinking, how you can help us process uh, inclusion? I do, and thank you very much. Uh, I just want to refer to the resource guide on page 32, those are always looking for speakers. And one of the first speakers of our inclusion movement was Rabbi Julia Watts Belzer. She's a professor at Georgetown, a feminist and an international women's and human rights activist. She, I think she's a timely and outstanding speaker. Good evening. I will be sharing some personal information about the parenting journey of my wife and me and how we interacted with the Boston Jewish community. We've had a long parenting journey with three children born over 11 years, all, thank God, are independent adults. Our eldest daughter was typical or using today's language, neurotypical. She embraced the Jewish community, JCC, preschool, Hebrew school, Bat Mitzvah, Camp Ramai, USY, Hillel, and to this day, involved in adult Jewish activities. Our other two children, sorry, our other two children's Jewish experiences were very different. Our son was born prior to community inclusion efforts and awareness. He has learning disabilities and major mental health issues. 
Because the teachers in classrooms were not equipped to handle children with his issues, he was asked to leave the JCC preschool and later Hebrew school. At the time, doors kept closing and we felt alienated. In middle school, he worsened and he needed therapeutic residential care. This was isolating from the Jewish community for him as well as us. He was not eligible for a Jewish big brother because we were a two parent family. There were no Jewish community volunteers willing to visit him and create a Jewish connection. We felt more isolated. This could have been a great missed opportunity for volunteers visiting those who are ill called Bikur Holim. How could we make a connection when none is available? It was suggested that we hire Marion Green, a gifted Hebrew tutor, to visit him weekly. In her infinite wisdom, she suggested rather than tutoring him in pre barabat mitzvah topics, she studied the Holocaust, modern Jewish history, and ethics. Then, when he was almost 16 years old, completing a residential treatment, his cousins and his sister were preparing to become bat mitzvah. He expressed interest in becoming a bar mitzvah at all. Marion insightly made a challenge that he could not resist. She would work with him for six more months to learn enough skills for him to become a bar mitzvah. If he did not reach the goal, she would stop working with him. At the time, his bar mitzvah was a link to the synagogue. He had a successful, wonderful Mincha Mara bar mitzvah in the chapel in front of family and friends, not a dry eye among attendees. That day he said, if I could do this, I could do anything. Post bar and bat mitzvah was difficult. Though he tried, he did not fit into the usual JCC, Jewish community activities, or USY sports. I'm not sure what's available now, and I know the Ramad Tikva program has broadened out to work with kids with behavioral and emotional challenges. We tried to keep a connection between our shul and Judaism wherever we could. For example, our shul engaged a scribe to create a new Torah. Our son attended this event with us. He is now married, owns a home, and works at a good job. Our youngest daughter also had major mental health and learning disabilities. When she was in Hebrew school four years later, there was a beginning of acknowledgement of learning differences and the need for resources. But still, Hebrew school support was limited. There was one classroom with a single teacher for boys with learning difficulties. They later hired a part-time teacher experience in helping teens with learning differences prepare for the name that's done. I want to take a moment to mention a small but important way clergy can engage bar and bat mitzvah teens with different learning styles. Our daughter's Torah portion was when the Israelites crossed the Sea of Reeds. The rabbi was very supportive in helping our daughter craft a creative feminist unusual to Bar Torah to which she could relate. Being an ardent cheerleader, our daughter discussed the Torah portion in terms of Miriam being like a cheerleader to the Israelites. Connecting the portion to Debbie Friedman's song about the women with their timbrels. Did you realize that Miriam was a cheerleader? In high school, our daughter had multiple mental health hospitalizations and was also in residential placement for a year. Isolation from the community, not support, lack of connection. But she now lives independently in Iowa, works part-time, and connects with her rabbi whenever she returns. As I reflect on my experiences, one of my overall Jewish community concerns is limited understanding and support and flexible use of resources for family like ours. Trained and supervised children and adult volunteers can provide valuable services for others, as well as gain greater understanding of personal difference, as well as similarities in the community. Some volunteer examples might include peer mentoring, connecting families with members with similar issues, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, visiting or communicating with individuals in residential setting, 
and helpful mitzvah project. On a personal level, my definition of success has changed. While achievements of at least basic bar mitzvah education is significant, more work is needed. Our community expectations need to make room for young adults who are not going to college or graduate school. After this journey of engagement and disengagement, we and our friends with children with disabilities have returned to become active Jewish community participants. I feel fortunate to have the opportunity to be the founding chair of our Shoal Inclusion Committee, and many folks on this are tonight were also members, and to participate in this outstanding program. The late Judy Human of Blessed Memory, known as the mother of the disability movement, reminded us when she was in Boston that 20% of members of all organizations have people with disabilities or chronic illnesses and may need accommodations. Progress in the Jewish community inclusion is possible. Continue to engage, maintain hope, and persist. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Great, great okay. message. I love the part about the impact that it had, uh, you know, that it, if I can do this, I can do anything, right? That, mm -hmm. that's, that's great. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. To, before we, you know, we're going to hold questions and comments and things until the end here. Uh, I think we're going to grab Eric while he's still um, uh, within... Uh, you know, internet <laughs> use. If Eric goes in or out, again, he's on a train. So we're going to try to squeeze him in now, if that's okay. Rabbi, you're okay on time? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, talk to us. All right. Thank you. And um, I have to say that I actually didn't prepare something. So I'm going to be doing this kind of extemporaneously. But uh, just by way of explaining um, why that's the case. Uh, so I have a college age daughter and uh, she is sitting five feet from me in, in, the, uh, in the cabin. And uh, I am moving her uh, back from Mount Holyoke uh, to, to uh, Melbourne, Florida, where we live. And, uh, you know, that is what I've been doing all of this week. And so I really haven't had much time to uh, try to focus on putting together a compelling message. And so this is going to be extemporaneous. I hope it's going to be decent, <laughs> um, but uh, please accept it as it is. Um, so um, like Jerry, um, some of this is personal for me. Um, and um, it's personal from a couple of standpoints. Um, so one of the ways that um, it's personal to me, it has to do with uh, my family story. Uh, and so uh, my wife passed away three years ago and uh, it'll be three years uh, next week, actually. And um, it was very difficult. And um, I have to say that if it wasn't for um, the help that uh, my synagogue uh, Beth Shalom in, in, in Melbourne gave us not only for the uh, for the first month afterwards, um, you know, with 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 meals and shopping, but then also um, just some some personal intervention, um, you know, placing placing us, uh, you know, bringing us together with some people we already knew, but basically helping us to refine um kind of a community, basically, um, you know, having dinner weekly with, with people that we already knew, but that weren't necessarily reaching out to us. Um, those kinds of, you know, and, and making sure that, you know, I was okay getting calls from, from um, friends in, in the men's club. It was these personal things uh, that helped make that first several months uh, a bit more livable, um, you know. And I think these were particularly important because you have to remember the time frame 
when this happened. This happened, you know, three week, three three years ago next week. So that would have been right at the beginning of COVID. Right at the beginning of uh, shutdowns in May 2020. So um, the first thing. The second thing is that um, again, my my family story. I I have an LGBTQ child, and so um, you know this is something that it means something to me because. Um, I want her to be included in the Jewish community. I want people like her to be included in the Jewish community. I think this is something that uh, I didn't have to be the one to advocate for her because um, my temple has had an LGBTQ president. And so uh, I have David to thank for basically having walked um walked that that um part of the way instead of me doing it um so these things these things mean a lot to me and um they mean a lot to me because they directly affect my family but um you know i i also bring the perspective of you know being from a smaller community than a lot of you. So um, it works differently when you're a small shul in a small community than it does when you're a larger shul in a place like New York, New Jersey, Cleveland, or whatnot, because uh, there aren't that many Jews in Melbourne, Florida. There's about five, 6,000 of us in the entire county. We're going to slide to Rabbi Rubin. Rabbi, um, uh, thank you for coming on. I've been to your congregation, and uh, I know the um, uh, open-minded manner in which in which you operate. So we'll be happy to have you share that with everybody. Okay. So, um, all right, I will dive in. I want to um, invite you, if you are comfortable doing so, to take a moment and imagine that you are walking into a space. And as you walk into that space, you say, gee, I wonder if I belong here. You say, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't tell them that I'm LGBTQ. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't tell them that I'm a single mom or a single dad. Maybe I shouldn't tell them that my child has some learning differences. Maybe I shouldn't tell them that I'm a Jew by choice. Maybe they'll look at me differently. Imagine if you are someone who has difficulty walking, either you are in a wheelchair or you have a hard time getting upstairs and you arrive and you're faced with stairs. Imagine if you are of a darker skin color and you walk in and someone looks at you and you wonder, do they really think I belong here? Many members of our synagogues have never walked into our homes, our spiritual homes, and felt like they didn't know if they really belonged. And even if they felt like they belonged in that space, they didn't know if everyone in that space would think that they belonged. I personally have felt that way before. I converted to Judaism when I was in college long before I met my husband and had my family. And um, I remember thinking in every synagogue I went to, probably for about the first 15 years, I better not tell them. I better not tell them because someone will think I'm not really Jewish. And we know that Torah tells us the opposite of that. Talmud tells us the opposite. And yet there is that fear of maybe I don't belong. And I think we all, share those insecurities sometimes. But when someone is part of a group that historically has been discriminated against, excluded, erased, um, made to feel like they are being grudgingly accepted or clearly not accepted, it is very hard to overcome all of that time. And in the conservative movement, I gotta say, 
we've made a lot of progress being egalitarian, but, but we're not fully there. When we, we've made a lot of progress in being welcoming to interfaith families, but we're clearly not fully there. We've made a lot of progress in being open to people who are differently abled, but again, we're, we have a lot further to go. So um, when we take a moment and really walk in someone else's shoes or wheel ourselves in on someone else's seat, the world is a different place. And for me, that is what B'Tselem Elohim is all about. We are all human. If you believe that humanity was created in the image of God, and no matter what you believe God to be, those are very powerful words. And when we remember that, we have no choice but to include people who walk through those doors, people who wheel themselves through those doors, people who come in electronically, people who connect in whatever way they do. So um, I too am part of some of these different communities. I mentioned I'm a Jew by choice. I say I converted, you know, that's what I did. It was an important process. It was a hard process. It was something I cared about. Uh, uh, Eric, you're, uh, we're here in the Amtrak conductor there. Um, at least that means the sound is working. Woohoo, that's good. So um, I also <laughs> I, I also have a son who's in the LGBTQ community, who's a senior in college. Um, I um, also have a, a hearing loss in one ear, so sometimes it's hard for me to hear. Um, I also believe passionately in people in services being accessible, and I think COVID has given us a, you know, at least one gift in that we've learned that we can connect people across the across the wires, so to speak. But I do want to talk about the challenges of being inclusive. And um, there are significant challenges. And I believe many of them stem from two things. First, an underlying assumption that not everyone is really but Salomelo. And people don't want to talk about that because nobody wants to be told that they are not being inclusive. But I will share with you a story I once had with someone who said we were talking about symbolism in the synagogue. And this person said, well, yeah, no, I'm very inclusive. I just don't want that on my bima. I don't want that in my sanctuary. Think about what that said to the person who was the that. Doesn't even matter what the circumstance was. This is a person who would call themselves a very inclusive person. And yet there is a place where that person is not seeing that something might make someone else feel like they have a home there. That's one, one thing. The second is that we as human beings have a natural tendency to judge others and judge ourselves. And so we are very good at saying us versus them, black versus white, in versus out. And as long as we drive wedges between groups of people, we are not being inclusive. As long as we find ways to exclude someone from a circle, we're not being inclusive. And so for me as clergy, the challenge is how do I help people bridge that divide? How do I help people see that if someone, for example, wants to come to a service on Zoom, in our congregation, we do Zoom for all of our services. Um, anything that's in person is also multi-access. Um, and I have had numerous people say to me, well, they're just being lazy and that's why they're coming on Zoom. And yet I know some of the people coming on Zoom don't drive at night. And I know some of the people coming on Zoom need the closed captioning for when we have discussions. And the truth is, it doesn't matter to me why they want to come on Zoom. If they come on Zoom, they're coming. And if we can get to the point where no matter what it is, we look at someone and say, welcome, we're glad you're here. And it's just that simple. If we put up the symbols that make someone feel comfortable, great. If we do what they tell us matters to them, great. But the most important thing is that we really see them as just like any of us 
And if we need to do something extra for them to feel that way, we should be doing. So I will get off the soapbox now because I could talk way, I'm a rabbi, you know, we talk. So um, I, I have not, I mean, we are very good at inclusion here. We have a lot further to go to, just like everybody. So um, I'm here to learn from all of you as well as to share our experiences. And thank you for Jerry, for giving me the opportunity to share some of my passion about creating a wider um, Jewish community within the greater community of humanity. So that's- Thank, thank you, Rabbi. I, I certainly took some notes. I, I Several things that I'm, I'm glad we have a recording too. So I can catch back on, you know, get back on some some of the things you said. But no, that was that was great. Thank you. Let's try to get back to Eric, and then we'll go to questions and <laughs> discussion. I think the main thing that I wanted to say, and I'm I'm not going to spend very long on it because I know how unstable my connection is, um, is that, you know, when you're in a when when you're in a small in a small town, uh, which we are. Um, you know, with only 5,000 Jews in the county, um, you have to operate a little bit differently. And you have to operate a little bit more on a personal level. And you can't quite um, operate in the same way. I mean, you can have these things on your website. And, you know, our website does does say, and our motto is that, you know, we're an egalitarian, inclusive um, Jewish community, but you know, we you, you you can't quite operate in the same way. And um, one of the challenges that we have had is with uh, longtime members, big donors who have not been happy and who have left the synagogue uh, because of some of the things that we've done or some of the members that they didn't like uh, being included. Um, and so I think that I'm gonna stop here actually. I'm gonna say that I'm, I really am here to learn as much as anything um, else, uh, but I am very glad that at Beth Shalom, we have a supportive and inclusive rabbi. Uh, who I can call my friend. Great, thank you, thank you, Eric. I, I'm going to make just a couple of quick comments, and then we'll open it up for questions that you have. Keep in mind that if you have a question, would you please make sure it's a question and not a 45-minute uh, monologue, because we don't have a lot of time. Um, but I'll just give you, I'll just give you a, a quick story. Be, because I'm going to be doing this presentation at convention, I've been thinking about my own experiences, and I don't have uh, really much of anything. At, my immediate family has no issues that cause them to be others, okay? But I wanna tell you just a quick story. My uh, daughter and my grandkids are in Rabbi Rubin's congregation in Springfield, uh, uh, New Jersey. And the, uh, my daughter picks the kids up one day from school and she, she calls me um, about an hour later and she says, listen to this one, dad. And I think this is really, you know, we're, I'm looking at our demographic here on the screen, right? And we, we represent a certain age group uh, uh, more, you know, on the screen than maybe some others. So I just want to tell you the hope that I hear. My daughter calls and says, hey, dad, listen to this one. The, I pick, was picking up the kids from school uh, today, and there's some controversy, something, I don't know what's going on, and they're talking about a kid on the playground and whatever, and I say to them, who are we talking about? Who, who's, who, who, what? And they say, oh, you know, and it wasn't anything bad. It was just a story, a little dramatic thing. It wasn't anything bad. So who are we talking about? And they say, uh, the kid in the blue jacket on the playground over there, the, the, you know, the one in the blue jacket. And my daughter looks over and she calls and she says, dad, they said the kid in the blue jacket. Dad, the kid in the blue jacket is the only black kid on the playground. But they didn't say the black kid on the playground. They said the kid in the blue jacket. So that says to me that my grandkids don't discriminate on skin color as much as people in my age group do seem to do, right? And we have to, in my age group, we have to kind of fight it to, to look at another characteristic of a person when we first see them other than their skin color. And so I have a feeling that our kids and our grandkids are going to be much better at this. And hopefully this kind of a session in 20 years won't exist because 
we won't have to say, well, I have a child who is gay or I have a, we, because it'll just be normal and won't be marginalized. And the day should come when we don't need to talk about inclusion because we are inclusive. And I just, you know, I, I hope we get there sooner than later. So, um, but with, with that little comment, um, if you have a question, you know, raise your hand. I can see everybody. Or um, uh, Bob, go ahead. I see Bob Watts. Unmute Bob and yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, this is a you know I'm I'm really dedicated to working on this. As you know, I was on the committee with Jerry to develop the guidebook, and I've been working on this for a while. And I actually fit a lot of the categories that we've been discussing. I'm a Jew by choice. I have a non-binary bipolar child, um, and a uh, and you know another child with some some learning disabilities. But what I've observed, and I'd be interested in anybody's uh, comments on how to kind of overcome this, is that when we improve when we approach inclusion in my synagogue, which is a very um, conservadox uh, community. Uh, there seems to be a dividing line. You say, oh, we're inclusive, but they're often talking about physical issues, physical handicaps. Oh, we have ramps, we have uh, hearing aids for, uh, for services. And so there seems to be a dividing line between, I don't want to call them easy inclusion issues, but the ones where somebody has a physical character, you know, where it's something so they say, oh, we're inclusive. We don't need any extra efforts. But then when you really get to some of the issues that we've been talking about, like the LGBTQ and the um, and other uh, learning uh, issues and, and mental wellness issues, then it gets a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit more difficult. And I'm just wondering if anybody has any experience about, you know, overcoming objections. Our rabbi says, you know, I've got this. We're inclusive, but we aren't. You know? So how do you overcome those, uh, you know, that kind of barrier between what I think are kind of the low-hanging fruit and the more difficult? So Bob, I'll just mention, and then we'll go to rabbi. She has her hand up, but I'll just mention that you're not alone. I hear this a lot as chair of this committee, that um, there is a hierarchy of acceptability of others, and I, I don't know any other way to say it. It seems, and uh, we'll let we'll let Rabbi address this here. So I, I think you're exactly right, Jerry. There is uh, often a hierarchy, and and you could call it the low hanging fruit. I call it the first step, right? Uh, I mean, it's kind of funny to say the first step when we're talking about ramps, but hey, you know, um, you know what I mean. It's the first movement forward, and um, it's a recognition that we might need to be opening our doors in perhaps a different way. It is very, very difficult for someone to realize that they are not as inclusive as they think they are. It is very hard um, for someone, I've done a lot of work in the anti-racism sphere. Uh, my son who goes to Oberlin, which is maybe just a little bit left of center, um, has done a tremendous amount of work in being anti-racist and not just being not a racist, but recognizing where is there systemic racism in society? Where do I, as a, even though I grew up a very poor white woman, I had advantages from being a white woman. There were doors that were opened to me that were not opened to my sweet mates from my freshman year at Princeton. Um, they had harder work they had to do. That did not mean I was advantaged. It meant that I had some advantages that perhaps others did not. It is really, really hard to accept something like that. It was very hard for me. It's hard for members of our community, particularly people who have been thinking the same way for a long time to think a little differently. So the some of the ways that I try to address this, and it, it really, it's as different as the number of people you're communicating with. And the, the first is to find out what is the barrier really? Is the barrier fear? Is the barrier judgment? Um, is the barrier politics? Because that does throw up barriers sometimes, unfortunately. Um, is the, the barrier just a lack of knowledge? 
Um, I have learned so much from listening to people who are in some of these more marginalized communities um, and particularly people who are part of the Jewish community but feel like they're not really part of it. I've done a lot of work in the independent community. We're all parts of synagogues here, right? But there are hundreds of thousands of Jewish people who do not affiliate with a synagogue because they don't feel welcome for whatever reason. We have a lot of work to do. We need to listen to them and that can help us. So the biggest thing is you know, they, they say that, it, the, that education is what changes people. Part of that education is getting to know someone into listening to what they say. So that would be the first thing I would recommend. Thank you, and 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 you know the other the other step. By the way, um, we experienced it here in Ohio when Senator Portman, who Republican senator who just retired, um, when his son came out, I think it was his son that came out. One of his children came out as being gay, and uh, all of a sudden he was much more um, thoughtful about what he said, what he did, what he voted for, uh, what he advocated for. So some of it, I think, is just experiential, right? And and, and the other answer I'd give to Bob is sometimes we set out goals that are aspirational. And you, you know that aspirational goals are things that come about at some point, that, that you know, you, you, you set, it, set it as a goal, not because you think you're going to be able to do it tomorrow, but because that's where you want to go. And you're signaling to people that this is where you want to go, again, at your synagogue or your club. If the leaders say, Look, I know we're not there today. As, as Rabbi said, what was it? Um, we're, we're making progress. We're not fully there. Um, I know we're not fully there today, but this is where we're heading. This is where we want to be heading. We want to be welcoming to everyone. Then some of these hurdles kind of disappear over time, I suspect. Other questions? Joe. Thank you. I just just want to say thank you very much for this program. This, I just this is the first time I knew about this program. It came into an email, and I said, "Let me let me go and just listen to see what what the world is all about." Because I many times felt exactly with some of the comments that some of the members, some of the people who spoke to in my own temple, and I've been a temple member there for fifty years. Great, thank you, thank you, Joe. And I should mention then, speaking of these sessions. Um, the next, the next, the next quarterly is on August 16th. So you'll get some emails if you're uh, FJMC members. You'll get you'll get emails about that August 16th. Someone asked a question, and it's a very interesting question. What are the thoughts of changing the name from Men's Club to something more inclusive? And that's it's it's a very interesting question. Traditionally, we have women's league and men's clubs or brotherhoods. Uh, women's league has affiliates or sisterhoods. Um, and it's a very interesting topic, one that I'm not going to take on tonight, but, but uh, there has been discussion about uh, the future place for gender identifying uh, clubs, I guess I'll just say, you know, organizations. And it's, 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 it's an interesting question, but, you know, I, I won't go into it much. Debbie, Deborah Feinberg, yes. Uh, unmute, please. Um we often talk about this, particularly in the LGBTQ plus plus community, in terms of a younger generation um, and responding because we know people, we are, as you pointed out, of an older generation. Is there an outreach of any sort or is there anything happening with people of our generation who have had to sustain this or survive this for 20 or more years, there are people in our generation who have been members of shuls who have not come out or who have had differences or who have hidden things when they walk into a shul. Is, there, is that part of anything going on in the inclusion environment? So the only answer I'll give you is it's really a tightrope walk between um, allowing people the privacy to live how they wanna live Right. You know, one of our one of our topics that we discussed as we were developing the guidebook was um, small groups, small group discussion, support groups for any one of these marginalized communities. And the fascinating discussion got into, well, what are we supposed to do? Call up people and ask or I heard you're gay. Do you want to join this uh, this group? 
I mean, it's just, it gets silly, right? So you, you, you bring up a good point and it's a really, it's a balancing act. I think, I think we've talked tonight from our, from our presenters about just being more welcoming to everyone. And when that message gets across, then if people want to say something about their uh, existence or their gender preferences or anything, they can do that. Um, and if not, not. Just to, from my own experience, it's been that sometimes when the younger people present themselves and the older people who have been reticent can step up to a place they never knew they had, they now have a role that they they weren't aware of, but they know what they went through. They want to make it easier. They can identify it. And so that that's a, a connection point mm -hmm. if it happens. Um, that That's what I've discovered through people I know, family situations where... Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it was like, no, I, I can't, I can't hide this, or, or I'm willing. I, I see a reason to present my true self, my whole self. Interesting. Yes, Rabbi. This is, I mean, a, a lot of negative things have been said in the last few years about safe spaces, but if we think about what a safe space really is, it's a place where someone feels free to be themselves, and that comes from relationship. So what we as clergy, what we as lay leaders, whatever role someone is in, in a leadership role in a synagogue or really any organization is to develop relationships and be someone that someone can go to. So I will tell you a funny story or what was funny to me. I had someone who once came to me asking for advice for Passover and said, Rabbi, I've got this issue. My grandson is a trans man and he's come and talked to me and this is what he's looking for. And I'm thinking, okay, well, what can I do to help you? And he's now vegan and I don't know how to make matzo balls for him. I said, okay, I might be able to help you with that one. But what was wonderful to me was first that this woman wanted to talk to me about it, but that she felt comfortable telling me about her trans grandson and that that wasn't the issue. And I thought all of that was a wonderful combination, but it told me that I had created an approachable space for her to feel that whatever she told me was going to be fine. And um, I think that's something each of us has to cultivate so that when someone feels that they want to express something about who they are, that they feel that they can. And they can without judgment. Thank you, Rabbi. Any last, we just have a minute. Any last words, Eric or Jerry? Anything you want to say? Yes, I, I just want to say thank you very, very much for this opportunity. I'm very excited about this initiative. And in terms of helping changing attitudes, I would say go gently, but also bring in a speaker from outside who can model uh, good solutions and that that will inevitably open up topics open up uh, interest thank you thanks jerry eric any last words that we can hear so hopefully you can hear me i think yes. what i would say <laughs> good i think what i would say is let's remember that we're talking about people and let's remember that we want a temple a shoal a men's club a, a women's league chapter we want those to be spaces where people can actually express themselves and people can feel free to be their true selves and not only be included, but be able to be those things within the, con the, 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 the confines of that space. That's what we need to remember. And so I think I'll stop there. I, I'm a professor, so I can keep talking, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, Eric. And I'll, I'll just mention that uh, there have been a, a few things in the chat about um, that, that remind me that most of the things that I see our men's clubs doing are open to anyone. Most of the, the activities and th that I see going on in, in my own club and in other clubs that I visit, um, it's men, women, it's anybody. It, it's really not, you know, we don't just, we call it a men's club event and then wives come and, and women come of all ages. And uh, so, you know, I, I would say that, that, that one of the, that we could be called a, a sisterhood in a men's club. 
that I don't think that's the big issue. I think the big issue is, are we welcoming to everyone? And we should be. We should be. Well, thank you all. It is nine o'clock, and um, we uh, we promised an hour. We gave it to you. Uh, August sixteenth is the next program that we have in this in this way. And if uh, those of you coming to a convention this summer um, on Shabbat afternoon, we have a presentation and some breakout sessions on the same topic. Uh, hopefully, years from now, we won't even need the topic. We will have already been fully welcoming to all of us. Thank you, everybody. Jerry, Rabbi, Eric, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Be well. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Good night, all.